Welcome to the Great American Collectibles Show, seen Wednesdays on the Sports Collectors Daily Facebook page and the Great American Collectibles Facebook page. You can also listen to us on iHeartRadio, Pandora, and Spotify. The Great American Collectibles Show is brought to you by the National Sports Collectors Convention and Sports Collectors Daily. Tonight's headlines are brought to you by Sports Collectors Daily. For all of your hobby news, features, and more, go to sportscollectorsdaily.com. And now your hosts, Tom Zappala and Boston sports personality, John Mallory. J.M. Zap. What's up, brother? How the heck are you? How's everything? We got a great show today, Tom Zappala and John Mallory. Welcome to the Great American Collectible Show. This is a special show. We're doing Very a wrestling show. show. Awesome show. We're doing a wrestling show today. Uh, we've got three, two and a half good guests. Two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half. Okay. We've got Mike Hefner. From Leland's, the CEO of Leland's with the purple, purple picture. We're going to just, we're going to. We're we're going to make that run. And then we have also uh, David Peck, who is, I don't know if he's the number one, but he has one of the highest, if not the highest graded wrestling registry. Okay. uh, On the set registry collection. Yep. And then we have an old friend of ours uh, who is... A friend we've known him for years. He's a he's an actual Hall of Fame professional wrestler. Wrestled he's in the New England, England Hall circuit. of Fame. Yeah. Everybody yeah. loves him. The fabulous yeah. Johnny also Vegas. A, but, also a, a long career in radio and television yeah. broadcast. So well, today we're going to bypass our headlines because we want to get right to it. Let's bring in Mike Hefner, president of Leland's, a wrestling expert. And on the phone, you see that picture? Yeah. The fabulous Johnny Vegas. Um, Hef, have you ever met Vegas? No, I've never had the pleasure. Good, you don't want to. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's, that's funny. Vegas, first of all, that's it. welcome. Yes. Welcome. You're, yeah. now, you're now living in Florida. Johnny, before we get into to your career, which, by the way, was very mediocre at best, <laughs> I think. He, that's um, that. Yeah. I mean, listen, that's that. you were the champ. I know that. But you were the, you never won a match without using some type of a of a of a foreign substance or something, right? Am I right? Well, he was a you were a heel. You were always a bad guy, Johnny, right? I, I guess so. I, well, not really. I mean, I just did what I had to win. That's all. It's not really being bad. Yeah, but in in the good versus evil, you your char- your I wouldn't say characters because they really are you. You were always evil, <laughs> right? You liked it. You liked evil to tough, tough you like to play to the I crowd. Just the a little. You loved it. You abs- And by the way, just to paint a picture. He's 145 pounds soaking wet. Well, he what? No, but when he <laughs> his, his wrestling rate was a lot bigger than that. He was yeah, it was 146. No, he was about 180, 190. No, no, I mean honestly, I saw a, once I saw a five year old bench press him. <laughs> I mean that's the truth. Now, half uh, Johnny, uh, the fabulous ah. Johnny Vegas is a member of. Who did you get inducted with when you got inducted into the Hall of Fame, Vegas? Uh, my class was uh, Chief J Strongbow, yeah. uh, Rick Martel. Um, Tito Santana, and me, I think maybe the Duke of Dorchester, Pete Doherty. Pete Doherty. Pete Doherty, right. The Duke, Duke, Duke of Golden Dorchester, Chair, yeah. I believe. <clears throat> so, Big names. Uh, and then there were, other, there were other local guys, too, some local people that were in as well. So, Would you ever consider coming uh, out of retirement? Because I think, I, I, I'll tell you what would draw big money up here in New England. Half and I take on <laughs> you <laughs> and Mallory in a steel cage match. Oh, Oh, we, I think we okay. kicked the hell out of you. We would absolutely I would do it in a heartbeat. Right? In a heartbeat. Half we would, right? Yeah, because you know, Zap, the only person I really have never beaten is you. Well, you know, Stop to <laughs> Vegas, with all due respect. And by the way, Hef, Hef has experience in the ring himself. We're not going to get into that, but he does have experience. Not much. Because uh, I've no, seen not I've, much at all. Because I've, se- I've seen pictures. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm good think, at getting was, that. I'm yeah, good he, at getting the crap he, out of it. I think that uh, but, Vegas and I would be like a second coming of Fuji and Tanaka. Well, Vegas, I, I'll just oh, yeah. the last guy. The last guy that Hefner wrestled. Can I tell him who it was? The last guy. Yeah, sure. It sure. was the son of Big John Stud. The and, son of Big John Studd. No, no, but he's as big as Big John Studd. Am, I, big guy? am I right, Mike? Six, eight. He's 6'8". Six, yeah. yeah. And Hef held his own. I mean, you did. You held your own for at least 10 or 15 seconds. So you... Uh, it, Tom, 
<laughs> Give me a little credit. It was at least 18 seconds. <laughs> That's at how least. long it took you to run around the ring seven <laughs> times, Hef. Uh, Mike, Mike, just a, a quick a quick Vegas story that I, it's always uh, it'll always be forever ingrained in my mind. He was fighting. Uh, you know they have those in the ring. Those there's 20 fighters fighting, and the last man standing like a battle royal. Battle royale, mm-hmm. and the place is is mobbed. I'm with my son. <laughs> And we went to go see the fabulous Johnny Vegas wrestle. 20 guys in the ring. He's the smallest guy in the ring. These 20 guys killed each other. And you know what Vegas did? He used his mind. (laughs) What he did was Mm -hmm. he didn't throw a punch. All he did was he just juked and maneuvered, didn't fight anybody, let them all beat the hell out of each other. Now it's down to... At one point in the ring, he actually sat on the floor of the ring watching what was going on. <laughs> At the end of the match, there were three guys left. Vegas and two other guys. The two other guys are beating the hell out of each other. And one guy has the other guy on the ropes. And Vegas is across the ring sitting on the floor watching them kill each other. He's got the guy on the ropes. What does Vegas do? Runs across the ring, throws them both <laughs> over the ropes, and wins the championship. Yeah, <clears throat> that's Vegas. that's cunning. So, that's that's intelligent. Vegas, that so was gold. No, that was gold. What's you, the bottom line? The, bo- bo- the bottom line is is winning, not won. how you do it. It's just winning. Well, John, you, you, Johnny, why should um, I uh, work ev- too hard? Everybody work knows smarter, not harder. <laughs> everybody knows John Cena, the famous wrestler, now movie star, television star. John Cena's father. John Cena Sr., who was the city assessor yeah, in the city right, of Athuma, yeah. but he also dabbled yeah. in wrestling. Sure. Now, did you ever cross paths with him, Johnny, in any of the circuits? Oh, yeah. Many times, many yeah. times. Yeah. And you yep. also, actually, you did a gig for, for the WWE as John Cena's Little League coach, I remember. Right. And, and John Cena, Cena, his father was there as well, too. Right, right. So, yeah, it was a, a thing called John Cena, This Is Your Life. And uh, I was John Cena's Little League coach. John Cena's father was there, his first tag team partner, I believe. It was hosted by Mick Foley. It was pretty, pretty fun, pretty and, exciting. And you also um, crossed paths with Killer Kowalski, right, Johnny? Uh, no. I had met him once, I think. Not really, though. But you taught. You, you've also trained people, and you've been taking part in wrestling instruction, haven't you? Correct, yeah. In the yeah. past, I uh, worked a different, couple of different places, and, you know, and just uh, uh, trained myself, too. So, you know, I went to schools, too, just like everybody else. So if you want to do it, you got to know how to do it. Well, so, John, all kidding we're aside, gonna, real, uh, you know, we've got about a minute left. Uh, up here in New England, yeah. everybody loved to hate you. Uh, you, were, you, were, you were a very, very entertaining guy. And by the way, for our viewers and listeners, any of you guys up here in the New England area, Rockingham Park is one of the most famous racetracks in the history of racing. No doubt. Up here for 100 years, the fabulous Johnny Vegas, who, by the way, his real name is John Vitale, yep. was the voice of Rockingham Park, used to call the races. And John, you did a great job. One of the great track announcers of all time. Really was. We worked with him a lot at wow. several radio stations, TV yep. stations in the area. One of the great personalities of all time, one of the great guys of all time, and happy to say, one of my good friends. Good, good guy. Yep. All right, Vegas, you can leave now. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, Johnny, listen, all kidding aside, good luck to you and uh, wish you the best down in Florida. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. See Alrighty. you, Johnny. Take care. Thank you. The fabulous right. Johnny. I did, ben. by the way, we laugh about his wrestling. I did see him kill six men in a parking lot after an event once. Did you with really? His bare hands. <laughs> with his stare alone. He took all right, let's down. bring in Mike Hefter. Oh, Hefter's already here. Let's bring in <laughs> our other guest, David Peck. Now, David has. I think it's the highest graded. I'm not. We're going to find out now. But he's on the PSA set registry. His uh, wrestling collection is absolutely amazing. David, welcome. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Now, David, is, is his collection cards? Is well, it memorabilia? What, what is in your collection? Yeah, David? tell us about it. Um, I mostly collect cards. I've got some um, figures. I've got um, some photographs. Lots of magazines, programs. Um, you, I, my sets are number one on the registry. You were not sure if that was the case. And um, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, the sets are on the PSA Hall of Fame. So it's, it's been um, 
an exciting run, you know, collecting the cards. Yeah, you've done, I mean, I, we're going to be showing some images uh, shortly, but uh, your, your collection is amazing, as is Hef's collection. Yeah. Um, Chrissy, should we just, uh, how would you like to do this? What Hef's, yeah, okay. She's going to be showing, as, as, I mean, both of your collections, Michael's uh, costume collection is just absolutely mind-boggling. I had the pleasure of once at being Hef's house. I want you to, our viewers and, and listeners, if you look at these images, that image, for instance, Hef, tell us about that. Those are wrestling costumes from, like, how many wrestlers? I cannot see the image. Okay, Tom. well, you have... Hef, yeah, you, just, that's okay, we can. Hef, just talk generally, talk about, about, generally how, about how you got these items, where you well, got them, and how you... I, how you came across them? Yeah, I started. I started collecting wrestling heavily about twenty years ago, and I've always been a sports collector. I've always collected baseball, basketball, football, boxing. Um, but now, to the point in my life where I'm selling off a lot of my other sports, but I'm concentrating on the wrestling. And uh, it really picked up about ten years ago. Um, it, it's been rather. It's been pretty. I shouldn't say easy, but I've been able to meet and, and befriend uh, a lot of the former wrestlers. And that's really where I've gotten a lot of stuff. And then secondary, you know, the second part is getting stuff from collectors. Uh, there are collectors out there. Unfortunately for us collectors, the stuff is going up in value, which, you know, I guess, fortunately, it makes our collections worth more, but it also makes it a lot harder to buy stuff. So, so. Of, of all the wrestlers that existed... How many costumes do you have from how many wrestlers? Boy, that's a really good question, Tom. I, I mean, I have, um, I mean, it's getting upwards of, you know, it's, it's in the hundreds, probably approaching, you know, 500 different costumes, singlets, pants, trunks. Um, it might be over that. And uh, I would say different ones, you know, it's hundreds of, of different. And th they're from all walks, you know, they're from NWA, AWA, WWE, WWF, uh, some independents, but most of them are bigger names. Do you have a favorite? Um, that's hard. That's hard. I mean, I have Mick Foley's mask. It was one of three made for him uh, when he was Mankind, the leather mask. And, and that's what, that's definitely one of my favorite pieces. Um, I also have, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, he he passed away last week, uh, and I was a big fan of his Bray Wyatt's uh, one of all his right. fiend masks. Right. Um, you know, so I span all. You know, I go back to your time, Tom. With, uh, you know, didn't weren't you watching it in the forties? Uh, <laughs> no, but but he was. Quite, quite frankly, he was just uh, a youthful twenty-year-old. I, I, I at got the time. into I got into <clears throat> wrestling big time with my brother uh, in the late fifties, actually. Uh, into the wow. 60s and 70s. And, and by the way, we're going to be also showing uh, images of David's uh, collection, kind of just a mishmash so you guys can get a really good idea of... David, I know you can't see them, but you will when the show is. Talk about, talk about your collection, Dad. I think she has some images up there on the screen now. Right. What, talk about your collection, you know, just generally. That work? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, for the most part, focus on the 1980s. Uh, I'm 44 years old. And so I started watching wrestling and diapers, you know, from Orlando, Florida. And if, if you grew up in Florida um, and your dad was in construction, there was a high likelihood that, that you were going to be a wrestling fan. So um, a product of, you know, the Hulkamania era. So I have a lot of my focus is on Hulk, um, Ric Flair, Andre the Giant. Um, I have some modern guys. I mean, what I try to also do, like you guys referenced John Cena earlier, um, his quote unquote rookie cards from 2002. Um, so, you know, I, I, I try to pick some of that stuff up, but, uh, for the most part, the, the 1980s is, um, my focus. And, you know, I have some, um, you know, obviously a lot of graded cards. I've got the autographs. Um, you know, it's, uh, to his point earlier, the, the prices of all this stuff have, you know, really escalated in recent years. And so, you know, it's made it a lot more complicated to be a collector, but, um, you know, it's great. It keeps you connected to wrestling. And, um, I think the other thing is, is that, you know, unlike, you know, sort of the pro sports, um, you know, a lot of these wrestlers are like pop culture, you know, icons. And so I always used to use the example that, you know, Mike Schmidt can walk in the, you know, Orlando airport and nobody recognizes him. Hulk Hogan, you know, wherever he goes, you know, it's like a mob scene. So, it's 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 a lot of fun. 
I'd like both you guys to answer this question. Uh, we can start with you, David. Um, was there a wrestler or a match or a personality that drew you to the sport as a youngster, as a fan? You know, I'd say just all of it did. I mean, Hulk Hogan, um, <clears throat> obviously, in 1985, became a national star. But in, we didn't have cable. And so um, championship wrestling from Florida is what we would watch. And yeah. so, you know, just having it turned on um, is what got me interested. And Dusty Rhodes would have been the sort of top draw in Florida. So you yeah. were kind of born a Dusty fan. But Hogan took it to a just different level. Hef, how about you? Well, between the age of I would say five, five years old is probably when I went to my first match with my dad. And it was a cheap form of entertainment because they did uh, television tapings for WWWF uh, in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. And we were only about 20 minutes from Hamburg. So the tickets were cheap. And uh, between the years of five and 10 years of age, um, I got to see all those guys in the 70s. I got to see Bruno San Martino, Andre the Giant. Right. Um, Baron Miguel Cicluna, uh, all the <laughs> one guys of my idols. That, you know, Love that more guy. More from Tom's era. Yeah, you know, he was one of my idols like from the Isle of Malta. Tom, yeah, Malta. He was right. from Malta. Right from from that era, um, and that's what really drew me in. It, it was a fantastic experience. You know, the thing you don't get with it going to a Phillies game, which I also went to when I was younger, but I don't remember those. I remember all the wrestling matches because you could interact with the wrestlers. Uh, there was a the side for the heels, a side for the baby faces, and they come out of the locker room. They'd be there behind the stanchions. And you could, if you were brave enough, you could go get the Wild Samoan signatures. Uh, you know, Haystacks Calhoun would be on the other I side. I saw Haystacks, his Westlacks Calhoun. So, yeah. you know, it was it was such a, such a, I was scared to death most of the time because a lot of the heels, like Georgie Animal Steel, would chase people around and he'd come out in the stands. But those those impressions that I have will never leave my mind. And this is one, these are some of the only things I can remember when I was five and six years old. By the way, later on in the show, uh, <laughs> Charlie Perino is going to chime in from JRI Cos because he is a wrestling freak. But anyways, <laughs> uh, f just a quick story about, uh, again, we're, we're going to talk about, after this break, we're going to get into some of the great wrestlers. And as I said, periodically, uh, Chrissy will be showing uh, Hef's collection, David's collection, uh, just enjoy it. But I gotta tell you something. George the Animal Steel, hands down, is my favorite wrestler of all time. And in another life, and you know this, when I had a business up at the beach, uh, he was appearing next door to wrestle. And I owned, a, when I was in co not college, when I was a school teacher, I'm going back 40 years ago, uh, my summer job was my brother and I owned an arcade. Uh, that was our summer job. Uh, as a supplement to my teaching income. Next door was a, was a big arena, and Steele was there for the whole week wrestling. He used to come into the arcade every day with a cigar, and we just shot the breeze. He was one of the nicest guys. And you know what he did for a living? Anybody know what he did for a living? No. Professor. Close. He was the assistant superintendent of schools, I believe, for the city of Detroit. No kidding. <laughs> he had a master's degree in education. Wow. And he's either, either the uh, superintendent or he was way, way, way up well, in, in the Detroit I found, school system. Um, I'm a wrestling fanatic, have been since I was about eight, nine years old. Came up right around the same time you have. I'm guessing we're right around the same age. Um, and I have found a lot of people say it's hockey players, and it's true from a media perspective. The guys, the wrestling guys, are the most down to earth best guys to deal with. They have their personas on the air and in the ring, but we, you know, having press pass, you go backstage, you interview stories from Hogan to Greg Valentine to Macho Man, the best guys, most down to earth guys. Hef gave me, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to get into some real cool wrestlers, talk about them, talk about their careers. But real quickly, when I was at Hef's house, we had the honor of doing some filming uh, for another book. And the first thing I did was I walked up to Randy Savage's hat, and I put it on, and I have a picture of me in that hat hanging very proudly in my office. Nice. That Ellen took. I love it. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. Peck is in the house. Hefner's in the house. We're talking wrestling. I want to get your opinions, guys, on who the best wrestlers in the world were. I have my opinions. I know you have yours. Hang in there. We'll be right back. Since 1996, Brian Drent and the staff at Denver's Mile High Card Company have led the charge in the collectibles hobby. Mile High is a full-service dealer specializing in buying and selling cards. 
and offers a competitive consignment program for all collectors. Whether it be their computer, want list service, appraisals, or auction services, Mile High has it all. If you've been searching for a company with a selection of high-grade vintage 1888 to 1970 baseball cards and memorabilia that shares your passion, aim high, Mile High. Go to milehighcardco.com or call 303-840-2784 for more information. This is Brian Drent, president of Mile High Card Company. Is your sports card and memorabilia collection properly insured? For easily replaced personal property, homeowner's insurance is all most people need. But for prized possessions that you may have spent a lifetime collecting, it doesn't go nearly far enough. Collectibles Insurance Services has been insuring for over 50 years. They offer a full range of protection and a zero dollar deductible at an affordable rate with no appraisals required. I know because they insure my collection. If you have a minute, go to collectinsure.com and learn more about insuring your personal card or memorabilia collection. Hi, this is Dan from Memory Lane Auctions here to remind you that the renowned Memory Lane Collectibles Company has served as a beacon of light to the collecting community for the past several decades. Indeed, folks, it has been our utmost privilege and pleasure to provide the most enthusiastic collectors with an abundance of the finest sports cards and memorabilia for America's most coveted sports personalities via our world-class auctions. Whether you choose either a private sale transaction or the auction route, Memory Lane cordially invites you to reach out to us to maximize the value of your prized possessions. Also, it is not just sales that we pride ourselves on being the best of the rest, because if you are seeking a particular keepsake for your esteemed gathering, we will be relentless in our quest to find that special piece to fulfill your collecting dreams. So no time to wait. Reach out to us today for the purposes of capitalizing on our unparalleled marketing capabilities. Simply pick up the phone and dial 877-606-5263. That's 877-606-LANE or find us on the World Wide Web at www.memorylaneinc.com. Now is the time for your valued consignment to ultimately become another one of Memory Lane's record-setting prices. How would you like to own the bat that was used by your favorite player when he hit that towering home run or game-winning base hit? Now look no further than JT Sports specializing in the sale and authentication of professional game-used bats. As the official authenticators of professional model game-used bats for PSA DNA, JT Sports will guarantee the authenticity of any bat purchased from them. JT Sports also buys and sells game-worn uniforms, gloves, and baseball equipment. The unique quality of the collectible is what JT Sports is all about. Give them a call at 609-487-8003 or check them out at GameUseBats.com. Okay, we are back, and we are chatting with Mike Hefner from Leland's, President, CEO, Chief Bottle Washer, and David Peck, the PSA Set Registry Wrestling Guru. How does that sound? I love it. Pretty good? David, yeah, all right? You'll, you'll yeah. never be able to you're say cool that, that again, though. You'll right. never get that right again. Let's talk wrestling. Now, I grew up in the 50s. I grew up <laughs> watching, going way back, guys you may not never have heard of, um, Killer Kowalski being one, but guys like Pepe Gomez. Uh, Pepe Gomez, he had the cast iron stomach. You right. Remember? I don't know if you remember him. I don't. Uh, I never saw him, but I've heard of him. Frank Scapa. Frank Scapa was from Boston. These are guys you grew up with in Lawrence. I'm no, pretty sure. Frank Scapa lost the world championship. I don't championship. think these are wrestlers, Have He lost the world championship. <laughs> and then guys like, he you know. Uh, he's known for losing the world championship. Then you get guys like, you get guys like Killer Kowalski with the claw hold. Yeah. Who was really the first, well, uh, uh, Vern Gagne. I don't know if you guys ever heard Vern of Vern Gagne. Gagne. Of course. You know, those guys were, those guys were, and then Bruno. Bruno San Martino, in my opinion, I know I'm going to get flack from Hefner, Peck, and you. Bruno San Martino, to me, was like the Babe Ruth of wrestling. Not Hulk Hogan. Hulk he was Hogan the is more he, like, I'll give you, he was probably like, well, he wasn't the first superstar. Gorgeous George was probably the right. first and, 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 Well, yeah. He but was. I will say Bruno San Martino was one of those icons you put up there, top Mount Rushmore guys. Hef, you agree with that? Yeah, I think Bruno was, was definitely, I mean... 
incredibly influential. No doubt. Uh, 60s, 70s. Yes. I mean, you can't take Bruno Sammartino out of the equation. And I, I think if you did, uh, wrestling would look different these days. David, what do you uh, think? So, well, he sold a ton of tickets. And to me, uh, wrestling is a show. And it's about putting butts in the seats. And Bruno had the, um, the fans in the Northeast going crazy. Um, he also, you know, you'll see some really cool images of him with like Roberto Clement and some of these other images. And he was really held in high esteem as a, as just a great person, um, in that time frame. And, uh, I think he's, he's definitely one of the best. Um, his in-ring work is maybe not, uh, as good as, you know, like a Terry Funk to me is right. uh, incredible in the ring. Right. Yeah. But good. Bruno had the crowd going wild and he sold the garden out you know continuously so he's right up there and then you got the peripheral guys like his quote cousin dominic danucci dom danucci uh, dom danucci was bruno's quote cousin how about the unpredictable johnny rods johnny rods <laughs> unpredictable because we didn't know how he was going to lose well you know i i kind of did a little research guys and my two favorite losers of all time <laughs> you guys i don't know half you may remember a guy named pete sanchez yeah. Pete yeah, Sanchez was O and 560. <laughs> yeah. All right? He was like the Washington yeah. Generals. And then right. you had another guy who was very funny, Angelo Savoldi. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> yeah. Ange- yeah. Another guy yeah. that was like, he was funny. He, actually, he was a tag team partner with, uh, what's his name? Um, the, the, the guy, uh, everybody loved him. The guy that was with, uh, oh, I don't I'll know. think of his name. Um, <sighs> Move on. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it really irritates me. Um, the guy who used to put the elastic band around. Lou Albano. Lou Albano. They were partners for a we while. We should be on Pyramid. Now, then we moved into your generation, uh, Hef, and then later on into your uh, generation, David. You know, guys like Spiris Arion or Sergeant Slaughter. Putsky. Uh, Ivan Putsky. I mean, is that when you picked it up, Hef? Yeah, I was a big fan of Ivan Putsky. Yeah. I really liked... Um, you know, I remember when he was tag team uh, champion with uh, Tito Santana, and those are some of the people that, you know, that I did see in person a lot. And uh, Putsky was just he was he was fun. You know, he's a little guy. He, right, he's wasn't, only, wasn't tall. You know, he was I don't know five eight five nine, but just built like a freight train. I mean, he I, was he was just. I think really you, you guys can both give your opinion on the turning point when wrestling became wrestling, when it became showtime, big time, was in the mid eighties when. Um, it was uh, Bob Backlund, right, was the champion. He was a champion for a long time, and he was supposed to fight, I believe, the Iron Sheik in a championship match. Another great. And, they, and McMahon, in, wasn't a good thing for Bob Backlund, Hulk Hogan shows up instead of Bob Backlund, and that was when Hogan beat the Sheik. And, then, you know, a year later, Hogan's on the cover of Sports Illustrated. I think he's still the only wrestler to be on the cover. But that's when it turned in the mid-'80s. And, David, I know that's when you said kind of that's when you started to get into your young guy, but can you talk about that a little bit and the impact of Hogan? Because to me, Hogan and Flair, maybe you throw a couple other guys up there, those are the guys that really brought it to a new level. Well, I think it's Hulk Hogan. I'll tell you, it's interesting. So I've been with my wife 21 years. And when early after we met, um, she was kind of shocked that I was into wrestling. And uh, she's two years older than me and grew up in New York. And, you know, with her dad, they'd watch on TV, you know, Hulk Hogan, Junkyard Dog, etc. Well, when I started to tell her about Ric Flair, she had no idea who he was. (laughs) So I think what Hulk has is, I mean, he was a superhero. He looked like the champion. He was larger than life. Um, And, you know... At the end of the day, um, you could argue Hulk Hogan was every bit as popular as Michael Jordan in the mid-80s. There's no doubt. I mean, his yeah. level of, no question about it. Good point. Yep. level of stardom was off the charts. But I think what um, really got Hulk uh, to a level that was just untouchable were these little LJN wrestling figures. And, you know, they came out in 1984, and every kid had to have them. I mean, unfortunately... We only had a few of them, you know, money was tight. It wasn't something they were like six, seven bucks at the time, which, you know, was, you know, I only had a couple of them, but you for sure had Hulk Hogan. I think they sold something like a million of them, which, you know, was, was a record breaking number. So I I think Hulk Hogan's the the number one wrestler of all time. I get it. He's not the best in ring wrestler, but I think he's the biggest draw. And um, to me, like I said, 
wrestling is about selling tickets, selling merchandise. Uh, and Hulk Hogan is, uh, in my opinion, the, the top guy. Half, uh, I know you, you like Hogan, but there was another guy that you really, I think he was your favorite, was Andre the Giant. Was the defining moment at that time frame that David is talking about when Hogan lifted J Andre over his head and body slammed him? Was that a defining moment in professional wrestling? Oh, yeah, I would say it's definitely in the top 10, top 10 moments. I mean, it was something that, uh, you know, the thing is, like, anybody that knew, really followed wrestling knew that, you know, Hogan and, and Andre had met several times in Japan, and Hogan had slammed him over there. But uh, this is wrestling, and this is what makes wrestling cool, because we can develop the story over and over Absolutely. again if we want to. <laughs> so that that's what's cool, but that was a defining moment. And, uh, you know, I agree with David, like, Hogan was probably the changing point, but he was at the right place at the right time. I mean, he had the luck, he had the charisma, he did not have the technical skills, um, whereas Bob Backlund did have the technical skills. The Iron Sheik had the technical skills, yep. but Hogan just, you know, happened to be there, happened to have the luck, happened to have the charisma, and he made it. Um, so, you know, the wrestling world owes, owes a lot to Hulk Hogan, but many of the guys that came before him, Paved the way. One of the great abilities in professional wrestling is the ability to do a dramatic fall. And I think the three best fallers of all time after being hit were Greg Valentine, <laughs> Rowdy Roddy Piper, and Ric Flair. Nobody did the and then eventually yeah. fall flat on their face better than those three guys. <laughs> Rowdy yeah, Roddy. That's well. a, that's a skill. Well. I want you to talk about Piper. Yeah. Because to me, uh, he's not Hogan at that level, but maybe he's just been with he, Piper's pit. When he hit right. Snooker with the coconut, that's an epic <laughs> moment in television right there. Right. Talk <laughs> about Rowdy Roddy Piper and his impact, both you guys. Start with you, David. Um, you know, it's interesting. I... I, I grown to think Piper was uh, much more influential now as an adult than, than even maybe 10 years ago. Yep. Um, one of the things, you know, YouTube is, is such a blessing for wrestling fans because you can go back and watch these clips. And I watched one from Portland wrestling recently where Piper literally busted a beer bottle <laughs> on his forehead. Um, and I got to tell you something that is commitment to the business. <laughs> I mean, it, it was unbelievable. <laughs> then he went right. to Georgia championship wrestling and in his work next to Gordon Soley um, on the mic. Then, I mean, you, you just mentioned Greg Valentine, yep. their dog collar match is <laughs> Easily one of the most brutal. <laughs> Love this guy. Um, that was classic. Guy. Love this guy. That was classic. <laughs> so I think where I guess I didn't like Piper sometimes is I think that sometimes these guys' egos get so big afterwards and, and where they sort of place them like a Bret Hart. You know, I, I, I'm not a huge Bret Hart guy. And part of the reason is he's just so negative towards uh, all the other wrestlers. And so I kind of felt like Piper was in that category. But he was he was amazing. Half. Yeah, I, I, I liked Piper a lot. I mean, he, he was a heel to the core. Um, you know, I didn't like when he, when he turned face then. Uh, I liked him as a heel. Uh, in fact, the whole coconut incident, that happened up in Hamburg. Oh, um, no kidding. All right. I think, I believe uh, that I was there that night. Wow. I can't be certain. Wow. So, you know, that, uh, the whole Piper's Pit thing, I mean, that just took it to another level. I mean, that was the first time that – a wrestler really had his own show right. within the show. Right. So, you know, he was, he was brilliant and he loved the craft of, um, you know, irritating the people. And yeah, he mean, was so good at it. You know, it. that's why, that's why, you know, you've got, there are certain guys that there were heels that really were entertaining him being one judge, the animal steel being yep. another. I mean, people just loved to hate them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was just, uh, I saw a whole, uh, Piper, I was in the second row at the garden, took my cousin, my younger cousin, and, and Piper hit Hogan with a mic stand that was outside the ring. It's a beautiful move. Beautiful move. Uh, you know, another guy, I'm going to throw another guy out that you guys, you may, you may or may not ever heard of him, but, you know, earlier, uh, Hef, you were talking about, and David, about actual skill levels. Technical guys, Do you remember yeah. Victor Rivera? I do not. Victor Rivera mm -hmm. was a oh, yeah. world's champ. Yeah. yeah. And he yeah. was technically, was he a good wrestler, half or what? Yeah, Victor Rivera was a, definitely a good wrestler. I mean, he was he was classified as a jobber, basically. I mean, he lost a lot of matches. Right. But 
he was he was definitely a, a tactician when it came to wrestling. He gets overlooked a lot. And then you've um, got then but, you've got your real real uh, guys who had tremendous amounts of agility. Crybaby, mm-hmm. crybaby cannon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you go way back, George man. <laughs> this guy, this guy weighed how much? He probably weighed four, five hundred pounds. <laughs> and his his shtick was, if you hit him with a shot, he would sit down on the ring and start crying. <laughs> and he went on to become a great manager. Did you know, he really? He, yeah. Who would yeah. you guys uh, classify as good technical wrestlers? Um, I know Pedro Morales had the figure four. Tony Guerrero and Rick Martel, which were a great tag team. I think both those guys were good technical wrestlers. Who would you put in the category of good technical wrestlers with moves and knew when to use them? We'll start with you, David. Well, I'll tell you, um, I, I think Terry Funk, who just recently passed away, I would put him as, uh, in my opinion, the best in-ring worker. Yep. Uh, I mean, his, he, he could sell like nobody else. Um, I think somebody that gets overlooked a lot of the times is Ricky Steamboat. Very uh, much Ricky so. Steamboat Good one. Had yeah. um, in really crisp moves, right? What an athlete. Um, yeah, yeah. Y- you know, I think, uh, I mean, Ric Flair obviously was a good wrestler, but, you know, it, when you get into the, I mean, Bret Hart, for example, like if you watch a Bret Hart match, I mean, he's, he was good. Shawn Michaels was good. There's a lot of guys that were good. Um, Bob Backlund, for example, you know, I mean, his strength level is just unbelievable. Yep. Um, so I think you have to, you know, that the technical aspect has to be not just, you know, could they get him in a, uh, figure four or, or do the leapfrogs, you know, um, it's just the whole package, you know, making it all work. Rick Martel, like you mentioned, I yep. mean, he was a tremendous and ring worker. So there's a bunch of good guys. You know, I want to ask you guys a question, the three of you, um, did the whole Andy Kaufman shtick, who was it, Jerry Lawler? Jerry Lawler. Jerry Lawler. Uh, David Letterman, that came to yeah. a head. Did yeah. that whole shtick for, for that whole amount of time hurt or help the sport? Hef? Oh, it definitely helped, without a doubt. I remember it, and, and I thought it was real. I really did. Yeah. I mean, it was so convincing. He, Andy Kaufman was such a good actor. And, and again, he knew how to get the people riled up Man, that and, he did. you know, I remember seeing him watch, you know, seeing him wrestle the women down there in Memphis <laughs> and I thought, this is disgusting. You know, what is this guy doing? And, uh, but it was so great. He wore his long johns into the ring and it was hilarious. I mean, Andy Coffin's one of my favorite comedians. I, great. He was, he was tremendous. So the Absolutely. fact that he got into the wrestling and he loved wrestling just made me like him so much more, but. I thought it was real. I thought Lola really hurt. Well, it was the way he the, you, what he did. Do you guys remember the, 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 the? I was watching the Letterman episode when they were both yeah. on, and they were, they were going back and yeah. forth, and and Lala slaps Kaufman, yeah. knocked him right and, out of his chair, and, 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 was, and yeah. Kaufman goes into this array of swears. You know, know, Letterman just genius, just standing back, off. right? He then he grabs him. Letterman's coffee and yeah. threw it at <laughs> Lala, and they come back, and Letterman goes. I, I think you can say some of those words on television, <laughs> but you cannot throw cuff. <laughs> David, what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's kind of a, it's a really interesting story because the, the public thought it was real for sure. And, you know, um, word is that Ben Sr., you know, Andy Kaufman had tried to do that in the WWF and he wasn't interested. And so when he went up to Memphis, um, Ben Sr. had, said to Jerry Jarrett, like, please don't do this. We don't want you to expose the business. Right. And I think if you're, if you really look at it, 80, by the end of 82, 83, when Vince Jr. was taking over, you know, sports entertainment started to uh, evolve. And so you could probably credit this angle uh, as the introduction to sports entertainment. Well, you know, so, Vin, you know, Vince, obviously Vince recently has had his issues, uh, Vince Jr. But I mean, if one man, one man solely is responsible for what happened to wrestling, it's going to be Vince Listen, McMahon. one word, WrestleMania. Yeah. I mean, I mean you re- talk about mingling sports and entertainment, right? Cindy Lauper and Wrestle- well, all the entertainers. WrestleMania being, really changed. WrestleMania, you know. Changed both, everything. Changed everything, didn't it, guys? F? <clears throat> yeah, it, it did. And, uh, you know, I'm more of a Vince, um, I'm more of a Vince Sr. fan than I am a Vince Jr. fan because I yeah. know that, you know, and this is just talking to wrestlers themselves. Yeah. Uh, I know that Vince Sr., the guys that are still around that worked with him, had nothing but good words. 
yeah. for him. He he really cared for and watched over the wrestlers. Uh, whereas Vince Jr., you know, it's all about making a buck. Yeah, nothing yeah. wrong with that. He's got a business, and it's a multi-billion-dollar business. But he, you know, Vince Vince Jr. did take it to the next level. But you got to remember, the guy who got it there was his dad. Yeah, uh, if it wasn't for his dad, we'd have nothing. Very so, true. Again, I go back to the old school guys and how they paved the way. I, I don't disagree yep. with you. No doubt about that. You know, um, speaking of, of, of wrestling, we're remiss in not mentioning some of the great female wrestlers. Now, I know nothing about female wrestlers of today. All I know is the fabulous Moolah. She was like, she wrestled t- till she was 112, she was. right? <laughs> uh, but uh, Wendy Richter? Well, Wendy Richter. yeah, I mean, David, maybe you can <clears throat> shed some light on that. Who are some of the female wrestling superstars of yes, Just, you know, when you were, when you, were you know, got into it and today. Well, um, obviously, Wendy Richter uh, in 85 yeah. was the sort of uh, poster child for the business. But um, you, you got to keep in mind that, women's wrestling was sort of presented in a more sexualized manner for a long time. Yeah. So like during the attitude era, the sables of the world, the Tori Wilson, Wilson, yeah, you know, they had like bra and panties matches, you know, Trish Stratus. What what it's evolved to today is like, you take somebody like Ric Flair's daughter, Charlotte Flair. Yeah. You could, you could, you could argue that she is one of the best professional wrestlers uh, that exist. I mean, her ring work is unbelievable her athleticism is unbelievable i'm not personally a huge fan of um the female wrestling you know i'm more interested in seeing guys like brock lesnar um you know the bigger guys that that really scare you but nothing can be taken away from the current crop of women's wrestlers they've really taken it to a whole nother level i think it's like you know women's sports across the board it became more athletic more skilled yeah you know, uh, you know, God bless you. I, I loved Stacey Keebler. She was fantastic. Still is. But, yeah, they've just – the whole the whole thing with women has grown in every sport. And that's Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, David, before we let you go, just real quickly, um, some of the – two of the peripheral guys that never really got in the ring, but they did, Mean Gene Oakland <laughs> and Jimmy them. Hart. Was it Jimmy Hart? It's the mouth of the South. Mouth of the South, Jimmy yeah. Hart. Yeah. Two guys that were really colorful that really contributed to the sport. True or false? I would say true. I mean, uh, Jimmy Hart, if you watch his uh, work, I mean, obviously he developed in Memphis um, and was there, I think, till about 85. And and then, you know, uh, WWF, WCW, et cetera. He was unbelievable. I mean, actually, and what's cool about Jimmy Hart is he's like 80 years old and still looks good. He looks great. Um, yeah. Me and Gene Okerlund, I honestly think he's just sort of a symbol of like, everybody's childhood because he was in the AWA in the seventies, the WWF. I mean, he just knew, he, he just knew what to say. And, you know, like in Florida, we had Gordon Soley, which was, you know, a completely different presentation. Um, I, I like mean Gene. I think he's huge. All right, listen, we're going to take a quick break, David. uh, We're going to let you go. Thank you so much for coming on board. Really enjoyed your knowledge. Uh, Folks, you know, you can take a look at his collection on the, on the set registry. Um, I can't thank you enough for stopping by. Thanks for having me on, guys. Great right. to meet you, David. David Peck, the PSA set registry. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, this is a, we're going to bring in, along with Hef, a guy that's been body slammed 484 times. Uh, <laughs> Charlie Perino from J. That's why he wears the hat to cover the bruises. That's why he's got the hat. His the top of his hat is actually flat. There he goes. They put another hat on. There you go. (laughs) Hang in there. We'll be right back. (laughs) Pristine Auction is a family-owned and operated online auction, specializing in autographed memorabilia, sports cards, coins, art, and collectibles. Since their founding in 2010, they've grown to two facilities in Phoenix, Arizona, totaling over 60,000 square feet. Jared Cavalier and an incredible staff of over 150 team members serve a very large customer base and enjoy every minute of it. By working with leading authentication companies, Pristine ensures all items are 100% authentic. In addition, third-party authenticators regularly travel to Pristine Auction to provide authentication services on-site. Pristine Auction strives to operate its business in a way that's honoring to God, their families, and their customers. With a strong focus on speed, quality, and premier customer service, their mission is to be the leading online auction for every level of collector and fan. 
Pristine also works for Hope Sports and Identity Hoops International, traveling to Mexico to build houses for the less fortunate. Pristine Auction offers several online auction formats with thousands of auctions ending each day. For more information, go to pristineauction.com. That's Pristine Auction, the best in the business. If you're a discerning collector interested in owning the most important pieces in the hobby, look no further than Leland's Auctions. The original sports auction and appraisal house, Leland's was established in 1985 by legendary pioneer founder Joshua Leland Evans. And today, President Mike Hefner carries on the tradition. From the Tom Brady card and memorabilia collection, to the famed Boston Garden auction, to high-end card auctions from every major sport. Leland's has always maintained the highest standards. Go to Leland's.com and get your bid in. That's Leland's, the hobby's leading sports auction house for four decades. It's often been said that championships are won on the practice field, and world records come only to those willing to work harder than everybody else. Heritage Auctions is the world's largest collectibles auctioneer, because we believe that becoming the best is only an invitation to the challenge of remaining the best. This requires the skills of the hobby's top experts, capable of identifying and maximizing value for our consigners. It requires the most visited website in the industry, courting a global audience of collectors over a million and a half strong. It requires a dedicated press department that expands our global reach far beyond the entrenched hobby marketplace. It's hard work, but a simple premise. Present the finest collectibles to the largest population of potential buyers, and world records will come. We invite all listeners to put the unmatched power of Heritage Auctions to work for you. Auction evaluations are always free, and our commission-based fee structure ensures that our interests are always aligned. The highest possible price for your collectibles. There will always be new world records to chase, so let's chase them together. Visit our website at ha.com and request your no-obligation review today. Hi, this is Dan from Memory Lane Auctions, here to remind you that the renowned Memory Lane Collectibles Company has served as a beacon of light to the collecting community for the past several decades. Indeed, folks, it has been our utmost privilege and pleasure to provide the most enthusiastic collectors with an abundance of the finest sports cards and memorabilia for America's most coveted sports personalities via our world-class auctions. Whether you choose either a private sale transaction or the auction route, Memory Lane cordially invites you to reach out to us to maximize the value of your prized possessions. Also, it is not just sales that we pride ourselves on being the best of the rest, because if you are seeking a particular keepsake for your esteemed gathering, we will be relentless in our quest to find that special piece to fulfill your collecting dreams. So no time to wait. Reach out to us today for the purposes of capitalizing on our unparalleled marketing capabilities. Simply pick up the phone and dial 877-606-5263. That's 877-606-LANE or find us on the World Wide Web at www.memorylaneinc.com. Now is the time for your valued consignment to ultimately become another one of Memory Lane's record-setting prices. Hey, I'm Mike Petroselli. If your company is looking for the best in marketing and promotional items, you'll hit a home run with Petroselli Marketing. With over 8,000 suppliers and 650,000 imprint-ready items, we can get your company the visibility it needs to get your maximum exposure. Whether it be office promotions, wearables, automotive, sports items, and everything in between, Petroselli Marketing can do it all. Our design staff will even work with you from concept to delivery and customize your products. At Petroselli Marketing Group, we will get your brand in front of your audience. Contact us at info at PetroselliMKT.com or call us at 603-880-3202. That's Petroselli Marketing, where no dream is impossible. So how does your company or organization do promotions? Imprinted products keep your brand in front of your customers more than any other form of advertising. For the best on-time service and new ideas for your next project, give Petroselli Marketing Group a call at 800-264-4294. 
or email us at mp at petrocellimkt.com. Before everybody says hi to Charlie, we can see him. The man's been body slammed more than anybody I know. Why don't you tell our viewers and listeners about our good friend, Joe Drellick, and the Philly Show. You got it, Zap. East Coast Sports Marketing and Hunt Auctions are pleased to present the Philadelphia Sports Collectors Show, the Philly Show, from Friday, September 23rd to Sunday, September 25th, held at the new location, the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center, Hall B, 100 Station Ave, Oaks, PA. Shop over 250 of your favorite hobby dealer booths on over 75,000 square feet of sports collectibles heaven from the 1800s to present day. Major sports auction houses and third-party grading and authentication companies are on hand to assist your collecting needs. The Philly Show is family-friendly, and all kids 12 and under get in free. Autographed guests to include Baseball Hall of Famers, Jim Rice, Ricky Henderson, John Smoltz, and 2022 inductee Jim Cott, Philadelphia Eagles Hall of Famer and legend Brian Dawkins, and many, many more. For more information, go to phillyshow.com. Remember, since 1975, the Philly Show is where it all started. Okay, let's bring in Charles. Charlie, how are you, my man? Hello, gentlemen. How are you What's guys What's up, doing? Charlie? One of the most entertaining guys in the business. He really right? is. I love him. People love him. <laughs> uh, Charlie, just real quickly, do you know half of you guys have met each other? Mike Hefner from Leland's? Maybe. I don't know. But I tell you, you guys can need to expand this show to like three hours. Easy, oh, right? Charlie, right? yeah. right? <laughs> uh, are hour. you a wrestling fan, Charlie? How you doing, Mike? <laughs> How are you? Are you a wrestling fan, Charlie? Oh, yeah. Whether uh, I, I used to watch the uh, old wrestling after racing from Yonkers uh, at midnight. <laughs> Mike probably knows uh, when oh, Vince yeah. McMahon was calling the matches. Uh, Arnold Skull and Bell. back when I was a little kid, and now I'm enjoying it. I enjoyed it with my sons growing up. Arnold Skull. Triple and there's H another name out of it. Yeah. Uh, I don't watch too much of it today because I'm caught up with the older guys. I love the older yeah. guys. We, uh, you like missed the first part of the show. That's all we talked about. Yeah. Some of the classic guys like Dominic Dinucci, yeah. Spiris <laughs> Arion. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to mention Dinucci. a guy. <laughs> I want to mention a guy. And both you guys, if you know him, can I know Heffel know him for sure. One of the my, my most favorite guys from the 80s, I don't think he got enough credit, was Magnificent Morocco. Yeah, Don Morocco. Don Morocco. He was, I mean, he was a big rival of Snooker's. He was a great showman. He didn't have a lot of the hats and stuff like that, but just a great showman in the ring. I heard earlier, Rowdy Piper, I mean, he yeah. was just classic. There'll never be another one. It's no, I love him. no it's doubt. In, no doubt. Instigating, he did. And he knew when the Piper spit, something crazy was going to happen. He <laughs> the drama and the entertainment. And like you guys said earlier, they brought the celebrities in. And from there, it just became one of the most electrifying sports to watch. Like my grandmother used to watch it screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and these guys do take a beating. Uh, my brother was good friends with Bam Bam Bigelow. And you can hear some, I'm not going to tell the stories about him, but you know some of the stories that could have happened to some of these guys. Uh, so it, it's really just phenomenal how these guys are great. Charlie, do you do much in breaks with the uh, wrestling cards? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tell you, we opened the greatest football, baseball, basketball, and hockey. But when a wrestling pack I see has to be opened up that night, and I don't care what – if it could be one of these, and then you know, Mike will look at these. That's a little out of focus. It's there you go. Yeah, there you 85, go. Keep them right there. Each. Yeah. Pull them back. Uh, yeah, there you go. But when one of these racks are about to get <laughs> open from 1985 – Move it back. Move it back towards yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. You see a back there you go. There you go. You see Lou Albano on there. Just a oh, yeah. classic. It's a little out of focus, but it's an 85 rack. And when you see Chief Chase Strongbow, the Grand Wizard guy, they don't have managers today like they used to. I know. Uh, uh, Freddie Blassie. Yeah. When these guys Bobby the Brain. To my Bobby the Brain. Yeah. 29 yeah. total cards and stickers. My whole show just gets more electrifying because I'm <laughs> mean Gene Oakland now, introducing these guys one at a time. <laughs> Half, you know, we didn't talk much about uh, Chief J. Strongbow. Where, where do you put him in, in, in the whole uh, uh, parameter? I'm trying to figure out if Greg Valentine actually broke his leg or he just needed some time <laughs> off. Maybe he hurt his back and they put a cast on. But there was nothing like having that uh, Peter Mavia, which was the Rock's father's father. Uh, there was Jules Strongbow. I don't think they can do it with the Indians. You saw what happened to the Redskins. They can't do it anymore. <laughs> it's gone. Half, what are your thoughts on Jay Strongbow? I didn't uh, like him. I didn't yeah, like him. I, I know he had a creative mind, you know, because he, he did go and work for WWF after he retired. Yeah. And I know he was highly thought of by Vince. Um, but I, as a wrestler, his, his shtick, you know. I, I totally just, agree with he you. He was actually, I think he was a, uh, a Boston guy, Tom. I think uh, his name was Joe Scarpa. <laughs> he was. He was. Oh. He was a Boston guy. But. From a technical standpoint, he didn't do anything for me. Right. No, 
Yeah. No. Right. He really did. He's it. not impressed. Hef, Hef, Ancha. Let's start with Hefner. Um, Mike, NWO, when that came about uh, with Hogan and Holland Nash and a few other guys ended up joining Sting, what are your thoughts on that? Was it more show than go? I think it was it was it was good, you know the the rivalry, the uh, you know it was all done because of the the WCW, uh, you know, WWF rivalry. Yeah, Bischoff, um, Bischoff and McMahon, right? right I mean, yeah. I I think it I think it served wrestling well. I think it it you know it it was interesting. It was a good angle to work, but uh, at the end of the day, it was just another angle, and uh, you know it, it's 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 only historical. Had it not been because it had had there not been a rivalry there between the two. Uh, you know, the two fact, the, the WWF and WCW, it wouldn't have been anything, you know, yeah. it, it, it's just, it just wouldn't have happened. It would have fizzled out, but uh, you know, it was cool at the time. Charlie, one of the great wrestlers in holds of our generation, Professor Toro Tanaka <laughs> and the sleeper hold. Yeah. My brother, <laughs> my brother, Al used to get me in a headlock and start grinding his hand into my side of my neck. George Steele had the sleep. Actually, yeah, right, him too. too. Yeah. Actually thinking he was going to put me to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to scream. I'm, I'm, I'm like, nothing's happening. Let Al's go. bigger than you, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> Am I right about Tanaka? He was, he was, I thought he was a great presence. Every wrestler had a great move. The figure four leg lock, some type of pile driver, some type of F5, whatever they call it. But there was a signature move, and... My memory is growing up, my boys doing those moves on him, giving him a rock bottom on the bed. <laughs> uh, being very careful, though, because so, I told them it's fake, but it's real. These guys take a beating in the ring. They oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to get both you guys' opinion on this, and it can either be from a technical standpoint, championships, or just your favorite. We'll start with you, Hef. Best tag team you ever saw. Now, by the now way, the, we have about two and a half minutes. The best tag team I ever saw was not Fuji Tanaka. It was Fuji and Saido later on. But, Hef, your favorite or best tag team wrestlers you ever oh, saw? Oh, it, it's so hard to make it. But I, I really – I saw I saw Tanaka and Fuji together. Yeah. And, and, again, I you know, when I was young in Hamburg and Allentown, and I – I was scared to death, but I loved them. The salt. The salt. The salt. Yeah. The I forgot about the salt. The salt in the eyes. I and that forgot was about so the salt. salt. That's right. Because I was just a kid. Yeah. So they are. We, I know we were just talking about them, but they're one of my favorites. I totally yeah. forgot about the Charlie, salt. how about you? Charlie. Best tag team. Uh, it's like, like Mike said, there's so many. The Samoans I grew up with. The Samoans, with, uh, the yeah. Dog, Rex and Spot from... Parts unknown. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bronx, you know, like he's a uh, chief chase from Boston. Yeah. Uh, the Valiant Brothers way back in the day. Yeah. The three yeah. brothers that yeah. were out there. So many. Tito Santana was tagged up with a couple. Yeah. Uh, two or three man tag team matches. But you know what uh, was the great? was when Andre got a three on one. Oh, that's right. The handicap. You know what was yeah. great? When, when <laughs> you had a tag team. And they would be wrestling, and then all of a sudden, one of the team members would turn against <laughs> the other, <laughs> against the other team yeah. member. I think Rick Martel to make the tag. You're like that close. I think uh, I think Martel tag and the crowd explodes. I think Rick Martel about. did that to Tito Santana at one point. They would tag yeah. him, and he turned on him. Yeah. All right, listen, we're just about out of time. Um, Mike Hefner. <clears throat> by the way, everyone, you know, everybody knows, everybody knows about Leland's. Mike, when is your next auction scheduled for? Have you guys scheduled an auction yet? Yeah. We have one. I'm the worst person to ask about that, but uh, we have one. I know, absolutely. Wall. We have one in the fall. It looks like it. Uh, I'm in Jillian's office, so she keeps track of things. Looks like he's going to open right around the middle of October. Okay, uh, Leland's. I have, uh, uh, you know, one of the one of the classic oh, auction God. houses. Great place. Yeah, you know, absolutely. This, you know, we talk about this all the time, Mike. There are there. There's a, a certain group of auction houses that. Are in a the highest echelon. Yeah, sure. And I, you, we know who they are. Yeah, we know who they are. You know, Mike, Leland's Heritage. Uh, I think JP REA. REA. Those are the those are the classic auction houses. Now, the smaller auction houses, they have their niche and they do very very well yeah. too. So, Mike, you've done a great job. Uh, you've been a great supporter of the show. I can't thank you enough. And, and Jordan, well, Jordan does a great job when he comes on. Charlie, you know what you mean to us. Uh, when the JRI cards, Charlie, what are you doing, 40 hours a week now on camera? <laughs> 40 hours, yeah. How about a five-hour show tonight? And I hope now this will sell out. I mean, there you I go. love this <laughs> And my top five, The Rock, Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold, and, of course, 
the nature boy. I even drink his drink. The nature boy. That's good. Woo energy. You know, by the way, just just real quickly, John Cena literally lives a quarter of a mile from me. Built an absolutely gorgeous home on the water. Yeah. Never there. His father and mother are there yeah. all the time. Yeah. Never, yeah. never there. They're doing a lot of movies, a lot of these guys. I know Batista, they, Cena, they do movies. Guys, yeah. again, thank you so much. This was this is one of my favorite. <laughs> this goes down as one of my favorite shows. Let's get that match going for uh, listen, charity. We are going to Hef and I against this clown and Well, you know what I'm trying to say, Mean Gene. And the fabulous Johnny <laughs> Vegas. I'll even I'll give you an out. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're Hef, out. Hef, I've seen you wrestle, man. I'm a little skeptical here. I've seen you ske- <laughs> And he's got rheumatoid arthritis, so we're in. <laughs> All right, guys. Again, thanks for your support to our viewers and listeners. All, obviously, you guys have been great. Thanks for your support and happy collecting. <laughs> The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.